it. You got it? Uh, no, those are all open. Just one is taken. Yep. Well, I think we're ready to go. So. Welcome, everybody. I am Rachel Chikowski. I'm a professor in the political science department. I'm associate chair of the political science department. And it's a pleasure to see you all here this evening. Thanks for making it out on a bit of a stormy, cold November. Um, but we're, we're here to warm you up with uh, some good conversation uh, on important topics. So the panel this evening is a faculty panel, and it's part of a series of panels that we have. We offer one a quarter and have been doing so um, last year and the year before on topics of the time, right? So topics that are of concern to community members, uh, students, faculty, staff, and uh, are uh, at the heart of thinking about American politics and U.S. policy making today. Uh, today, uh, the panel is on the politics of terror and terrorism. What I really like about this faculty panel is you're really seeing uh, a cross-cutting of our uh, department in terms of different fields. So we have uh, international relations faculty, we have American politics faculty, and we have uh, American politics faculty represented here this evening, and comparative politics, am I repeating myself? <laughs> um, so this is great, because not all topics cross that many different fields. Uh, so this certainly is going to um, be a lively conversation and give you um, a variety of different perspectives and political science perspectives. I'd like to start by introducing the professors that are here to speak on the panel. And then I'll talk a little bit about panel uh, protocol and what the schedule is going to be. Uh, we really see this as an opportunity not only to share the expertise of the political science department with um, our students, uh, with faculty, staff, alumni, community members, but it's also a way for you to engage with the faculty and their expertise. So we want to make sure we leave time for questions within the time that we're here this evening. So starting from your right is uh, Professor Jeff Wallace. Uh, he's an associate professor in the political science department. His research, teaching, and publications specialize on areas of international security, international law, with a focus on the conducts of actors during armed conflict. He also has interest in the design and effectiveness of international institutions, as well as public opinion and foreign policy. He's currently working on a book project examining the domestic sources for the enforcement of international legal commitments. He teaches courses on international law, international organizations, political violence, international conflict, and international relations theory. Next over is Megan Ming Francis. She is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. <laughs> what? Oh, associate. Oh, my God. Sorry. Wait. Yeah, you're like, what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that bio is wrong that they put on there. Woo, woo. So we're very excited that she is now tenured in our department. I'm like, wait, did you switch departments? Did I get that wrong? No. <laughs> um, we are super excited to have snatched her as an assistant professor and tenured her, which as many of you know is an important stage in a professor's career. So it's exciting that she remains uh, part of our, our flanks. So she, uh, her research, teaching, and publications specialize in the study of American politics, race, and the development of constitutional law. She's particularly interested in the construction of rights and citizenship, black political activism, and the post-Civil War South. Uh, Francis is currently at work on a book project that examines the role of the criminal justice system in the rebuilding of the southern political and economic power of the Civil War. Next over is Ellis uh, Goldberg, who is a professor emeritus in the Department of Political Science. Uh, he's also former chair of the UW Middle East Center, which is associated with the Jackson School of International Studies. His research, teaching, and publications focus on comparative politics, Middle East politics, and international political economy. Research projects include studies of the Egyptian labor movement and also research on Muslim political movements in Islam, the origins of the post-colonial trade union movement in Egypt, and human rights. So you can see you have a wealth of expertise um, at your disposal here this evening. So the way we're going to proceed is uh, each of the faculty members is going to come up, speak for around 15 minutes. Uh, my job as chair and moderator is to keep them on task so they don't run on too long. 
Uh, and then we'll proceed to an open question and answer. So we ask that each of you raise your hand high. We will call on you that we all take turns and don't talk over each other. We should be able to fit everybody's questions in. And for sure, we'll see um, if, you know, as we start, we do only, you know, have so much time in the room this evening, but you're also welcome to come up afterwards um, if a question isn't addressed. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over so we can keep on task. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, good to thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you, obviously, to Professor Chkowski, Catherine, and the rest of the staff for putting together this really um, interesting panel uh, in terms of across everyone. Um, and so, um, as Professor Chkowski noted, my main focus is on international law, so I think I'll be keeping my comments a little bit more general, um, but hopefully still brief. I'm honestly more interested in hearing what my colleagues uh, have to say, who I'll note from their titles, I think have set a fairly high bar, um, especially in terms of the time period in which they're covering. So I will at least try to up the ante um, even a little bit further by starting my talk back in 1648. Um, and so that's the, you know, like the painting up here is you know, one of a bunch of older uh, European gentleman, which is uh, from the Treaty of Westphalia, or the Peace of Westphalia, I should note, that was a combination of several treaties. Uh, and so this is really, at least you know, if you take international, intro to international relations class, is really seen as the, the birth in some ways of the modern international system of uh, sovereign states. Um, but what's sometimes forgotten is that the war, you know, it was, uh, the treaty was, or the Peace of Westphalia was the, um, the end point of the Thirty Years' War, which at least as part of its um, early beginnings were motivated by a transnational force, which was religion, or especially religious conflicts uh, between um, both Catholics uh, and Protestant ideologies. Um, and this war was extremely destructive. Uh, really, Europe didn't see anything similar until um, the World Wars uh, that began almost 300 years later. Uh, and so Westphalia is really, I think, a recognition by states at the time of the threat that some of these forces posed to their collective stability and existence. So when I look at Westphalia, I really see it as a compromise, um, an agreement in some ways amongst these actors to put some constraints on their competition, acknowledge that they're still rivals, uh, but realize that they also had a common interest in ensuring that states uh, remain or at least became the most relevant political um, units and actors. Um, and so while it's seen as the beginning of the international system of states, I really view it more as the beginning of the international society of states, where you have a group of actors with common baseline interests which accord each other rights and privileges, such as mutual recognition um, and especially non-intervention in each other's affairs. Um, so in this light, if you think of terrorism today, um, it might be viewed as a new transnational threat um, to this society of states, and it's no coincidence at least some of the most uh, destructive groups or the groups that get the most attention um, happen to be at least uh, in terms of outwardly religiously motivated. Um, and so my comments for today, what I really want to kind of focus on is that while I think we can agree that any single state at any point in time does not certainly welcome um, a terror attack um, by any means, both individually and collectively, I think this specter of terrorism um, provides in some ways a resource and an opportunity that the International Society of States um, have used and I think will continue to use um, to perpetuate its position. Um, so the implications when I think about terrorism for this society is I think it allows a few uh, key things. Um, one, it allows a deflection um, from the scale of state violence, um, which is massive. Um, both in contemporary and historical periods. Um, second, it provides justification for further state violence. Um, third, it provides, um, you know, especially since I think terrorism has taken on such a pejorative, I mean, it's really, I think, a pejorative term in a lot of ways. I mean, it really allows a dehumanization of others um, who might be terrorists, but also other vulnerable groups. Um, and then finally, I think putting all this together is to see how terrorism actually allows for, rather than a threat, um, to states is really a consolidation of this international society. And so these aren't, um, I'll be talking about them each in turn, but they're really not, um, you know, they're not wholly separate from each other. Um, so for instance, you know, dehumanization of others serves as a, as a basis for justifying state violence. Um, and I think all three of the first ones really then contribute to this overall consolidation process. Um, so first, thinking about terrorism, and I think this is one of the um, important things in terms of when we bring together 
um, scholars from a lot of different areas. I think you'll hear uh, different definitions from my colleagues as well. But the one I want to focus on is a much more a narrower definition. It's one that's used by my chosen field of IR, um, but I think also reflects the, you know, one of the power that states, meaning countries, um, really have in terms of being able to set the terms of debate. Um, and so when I talk about terrorism, uh, I'm really following, so for instance, in the U.S. Code, the way that they define terrorism, which is primarily as um, a non-state phenomenon, or at least um, actions that are perpetrated by non-state actors. Uh, and this is really followed very closely um, within the field of international relations. So when I think one of the, you know, one of the biggest uh, sort of um, brush clearing or conceptualizing pieces by Kidd and Walter about of a decade ago, you know, provides a very short, very simple definition of terrorism as the use of violence against civilians by non-state actors to, to attain political goals. Uh, and I think this is generally a definition that also states um, seek to perpetuate because note what this means. It means that when states engage in violence, they cannot be engaging in terrorism. They might be engaging in other forms of violence, but not terrorism. And the flip side, since I kind of feel like I have to at least you know, define the terms that I have in my title, um, is to look at sovereignty, which very much is a state property. And so for here, you know, like a lot, I'll kind of go back to, um, uh, to Max Weber, uh, who I think provides, I think, one of the, the core definitions for this is um, really as you know, a state, um, is an actor insofar as its administrative status successfully holds a claim on, and this is the key part, the monopoly uh, of the legitimate use of violence in the enforcement of its order. So sovereignty is inherently tied to violence. Um, and so I think one of the links between sovereignty and terrorism is that violence is key. Um, the difference is the legitimacy uh, of the perpetrator. And so states have wielded violence and use it to maintain and both expand order, both domestically um, and externally. Basically, the way that states came to be in the place where they are now is because they were the actors who were most efficiently able to wield that violence. And sure, they provide public goods as well, roads um, and the like, but all, a lot of this is at least initially and continues to be predicated on violence. Um, and so in one way, you might think that looking at terrorism, you know, the perpetration of violence by non-state actors would represent a challenge to states' monopoly on violence. But I think if we kind of look at especially this narrow definition, which I don't think is the only definition, but I think it's one of the, um, one of the dominant definitions, um, when we put terrorist violence in context, this is to say that all deaths um, certainly, certainly should be lamented, but the scale of violence that is associated with terrorist actors, so non-state actors that are targeting civilians for political purpose, as you'll see from the next slide, simply you know, pales in comparison. So there's you know, just as there's many different sorts of terrorism, there's also a lot of different uh, data sets on terrorism. This is, you know, one uh, you know, kind of collection of work by um, James Piazza and some colleagues uh, that was looking over the period 1968 to 2005. And so I realize I'm at a real angle here, but the, the pie on the left, you know, looks at the number of attacks, and the one on the right uh, looks at the number of casualties. And so they, you know, they also differentiate between, you know, terrorist groups that have um, particular ideologies, so religious, separatists, rightists and leftists and the like, you know, but when they tally up everything, what you get is around you know, 75,000 deaths. Um, and again, this is you know, an enormous number for sure. Uh, other projects put this, you know, put this number a little lower. Um, others you know, maybe put a lot higher, but it's somewhere around, I think that one of the max was around 150,000. The other thing I'll note is that the vast majority of these deaths are due to domestic terrorists. So international terrorists, the Al-Qaeda's and such, are associated with a um, proportionally much smaller number. Um, and so you know, these, you know, these deaths, um, even measured in the, in the thousands, allow states, I think, to focus on the scourge of terrorism. It allows them in some ways to deflect their publics, um, but also the broader community um, from, frankly, what has been the bigger source of violence. Um, and that's been states themselves. Uh, and so the first one here is really to focus on deflection from the scale of state violence, uh, which again, there's a lot of different debates over here, but one conservative number uh, is by the scholar um, R.J. Rummel, um, who looks at state violence, AKA death by government. And he's covering a you know, different time period um, from the one I had on the previous you know, slide, but you know, his view of you know, state perpetrated mass murder um, is around 170 million persons. So 75,170 million. And we're talking about you know, huge differences 
um, in order of magnitude. So this includes you know, Stalin's Soviet Union or Mao's China um, or Pol Pot's Cambodia, um, where at least in the case of the Khmer Rouge, they were able to kill off a quarter of their population in four or five years. Um, and so you know, by turning the debate to be focusing on this new threat of terrorism, um, they're able to deflect from their own violence. And so we have various terms, I think, that apply to state perpetrated violence. Uh, repression, mass killing, politicide, genocide, democide. Um, but I think a lot of these don't carry the same symbolic impact uh, that, terrorism, uh, that terrorism holds. So we're very quick to label a, an event um, terrorism, but we are much slower to do the same um, for a lot of government perpetrated killings. Um, and so there's a lot of, I think, of selective outrage, um, but also silence. Uh, and so for every Libya um, or Kosovo, there is what's been going on in Syria, um, or what is continuing to go on right now um, in, in Myanmar. And I think part of this is because the society of states is looking to preserve um, that common principle of sovereignty, and so the threshold for violence remains very high. Um, and this is similarly, while I think there's a lot of promise in emerging norms like responsibility to protect, I think they remain really weak and inconsistent. I think probably perhaps most troublingly is how states have in some ways co-opted this term to justify um, particular behavior, uh, such as um, Putin's annexation of Crimea, which was said to be quote unquote uh, on humanitarian grounds and consistent here. And so, you know, the focus on this hysteria around terrorism, I think, allows states to center the discussion on this non-state threat and place themselves as the protector of the people, which leads to um, the second component, which is really this justification of further violence um, as a need to deal with this threat and the real loosening, I think, of constraints against terrorist foes. You know, so there's this interview that Dick Cheney, as vice president, gave a few days after 9-11 where he talked about the need to work on the dark side. Um, and the administration most certainly did that. And this applied, I think, not only to terrorist suspects um, or suspected detainees, but has also had implications for citizens and other groups as well who might not even be directly connected to a conflict. Because I think this label of terrorist really carries such emotional baggage, or the way that it has been used has carried such emotional baggage that it can be used by states to justify broader forms of violence and control. So you look at what's happening in Myanmar right now. So here, the title here is Burma. Um, but not the, you know, with the, you know, the large-scale ethnic cleansing uh, and large-scale massacres is, you know, being the, the military is portraying this as a military operation to root out terrorists. And the same argument has been used by um, Turkey with regards to um, Kurds uh, and Syria, um, Assad Syria and its description of protesters during the early period of the Arab Spring. This is not, not to say that there aren't objective threats to the state, but it's be able to use as justification for dis disproportionate violence, often against vulnerable groups. And how they've been able to go about doing so, um, I think is through the pejorative nature of this term and that allows a real dehumanization of others. Um, and so I'll just kind of put up a couple quotes that have you know, surfaced over the last few years that involve our own country, um, but you really see similarities in uh, other countries as well. Um, so you know, on the campaign trail, Donald Trump talking about the thing with the terrorists, you have to take out their families. Really, no one is, uh, no one is immune from attacks. Um, or in terms of particular tactics, would I approve waterboarding? You bet your ass I would, in a heartbeat. If it doesn't work, they deserve it anyway for what they're doing. And so these are both, think about it, I mean, this is really saying the Constitution, you know, protections uh, against cruel and unusual punishment should just be thrown aside. Um, and I have to talk about, I, this is, I think, a bar, bipartisan element, so I don't think this is by any means um, with one party. And so I think all this kind of comes together, and I think I'm sort of running out of time, uh, is to, to really note how you know, was 9-11 the beginning of the end of the international system as it sometimes has been described? I mean, perhaps, we're still in early days. Um, but when I kind of like look back over what's happened over the subsequent years, I really see this as a reassertion of state authority. I mean, just look at a few different measures. Think about the expansion of domestic security apparatus. It's a ballooning budget, not only budget, but also mandate of the Department of Homeland Security, the rise of surveillance powers, even the rewriting of the basic social contract. So France experiences um, terror attacks in 2015. It's been in a state of emergency ever since, which has been renewed, and the, the undermining of civil liberties. The state of emergency got lifted in November, um, just last month. 
but it was replaced by a new counterterrorism law, which in essence is a permanent state of emergency. And so the powers that are being accrued um, to states, both individually, um, but also in collaboration with each other, um, I think kind of go to show the way in which terrorism certainly represents a threat, um, but has also represented an opportunity for these states to maintain their society of sovereigns. So thank you very much. Um, we would just ask if there's, like, there's an empty seat right here in the middle. Maybe look around. Anybody else have, I see an empty seat over there. There's two of them in here. So please feel free to come in. This is a moment the presenters are changing their presentations. Please feel free to walk in and grab those extra seats. There's one right down here in the front. All right, great. Oh, that sounds loud. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. First, I want to thank uh, Richard Joukowsky, Michael McCann, Mira Roy, Catherine, as well as everybody else um, who helped bring this together, and all of you decided to spend your evening here with us. All right, um, so, so, so I want to try to do a few things, or at least uh, try to think through this idea of terrorism, state terrorism, um, and where we are right now in our country. Uh, so that what we know for sure, of course, was that this summer was a doozy, right? In so many ways. I think my title has some words such as uh, the Civil War in Charlottesville in the title. Um, and so initially, I started to, to think about my comments or my remarks today in terms of how we might think about what is going on right now as terrorism and linking it back towards the past. Um, so I, what I don't want to do is in terms of thinking about where we are and thinking about the crazy events that have happened um, this summer um, by saying that Trump or something like is, or, is Trump or racist white people got us here, not because I don't think that's what it is, but because it lets our, I think, our collective history off the hook. Uh, when we resort to explanations such as this, we do so in so many ways that we can so that we can situate it away from us, um, us good people. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, today so some public talks that I sometimes give, as well as my own research, um, and also a tiny bit of personal stories um, as well. So I'll just begin a, a fun slide here. There we go. There we go. All right. Um, and this is not going to relate to exactly what I'm talking about right now, but it will relate somehow, some way. You shall see. Um, so in so many ways, I think oftentimes it's been like the stories that I've, at least I've seen in the news over the summer. It's that it's those Southerners, those Confederate flag-waving backward folk. It's them, but I think it's also us. Uh, my first blatant experience uh, with racism and a type of kind of racial fear, many of you guys know in this audience, I see some familiar faces. I was born and raised in Seattle. I went to Garfield High School. Uh, one of our um, Garfield High School football games, apparently the team is better now. Um, it was really bad back then. Uh, we went to across the east side to Juanita High School. Um, and we were really excited. I obviously was not on the team. I was part of the journalism group. Um, and, and for us, um, what happened over there is things that I never saw before. The student body was almost all white. They waved the Confederate flag in the stands. Students had the Confederate flag painted on their faces. And the assistant football coach, our assistant football coach, who was an African-American man, had his car keyed with the N-word. I was mad, I was shocked that this could happen in a place so close to Seattle. I also wanted it to rain so that the face paint could fall away, right? Um, I realized in that moment, though, that a lesson, a lesson that I would never forget uh, was, was that no matter where we are in this country, we are never too far from our racist past. Um, and I, I've spent a long time um, thinking about this quote over the last nine months here. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. I've been trying to understand what it means to face it with courage. Um, 
and, and I'm not sure that we're there yet in 2017. I'm not sure that we're not going to relive this again. All right. This is going to be fun. Some of you guys have seen this before. Actually, we're going to go back. We're going to come back, and then we're going to go back. All right. Uh, so in, in the evening of August 11th, 2017, white nationalists and neo-Nazis marched on Charlottesville, Virginia with tiki torches, giving the Nazis salute and chanting phrases such as white lives matter. They came from all over the country, um, even from eastern Washington. Their mission, which they all chose to accept, was to stop the nation from eroding the power of these white men. The anger on their faces we know. Uh, Oh, no, we don't have that. We'll come back to that, too. The anger on their faces was palpable in the glow of the torch's light. These young men continued their onslaught at an afternoon rally the following day at a park featuring a prominent statue of Robert E. Lee, the top Confederate Army commander, which was slated to be removed. By this time, Ward had gotten out, and the nation's media descended on Charlottesville. Counter-protesters, of course, showed up. They got organized with signs reading Black Lives Matter and Love Not Hate. Police decked out and militarized riot gear attempted to prepare for the inevitable. Charlottesville was a powder keg ready to explode, and it did. At 2 p.m., a neo-Nazi deliberately drove a car into the crowd of counter-protesters, killing one woman because we say their names, Heather Heyer, and injuring seven more. This was the face of white rage, ready to kill white people, even if necessary, to protect against a society that was slowly, slowly trying to become a tiny bit more equal. The images of the violent mob of mostly white men sent shockwaves through a nation deeply divided by race. The tragic events, of course, did not surprise Donald Trump. He refused to call out and denounce the white supremacist violence in Charlottesville, instead reluctantly blamed the hatred, bigotry, violence on many sides, even going so far as to point out that there were many fine people. Despite its high tolerance of racism, Charlottesville was too much for the current Republican Party to handle, a surprise, of course. Many conservative politicians critiqued Trump's remarks and condemned the violence. I received many emails from former students and texts from friends and was asked to write an article for the Washington Post. Everyone seems so stunned by Charlottesville. And you, some of you guys have heard me say this before. I confessed I was, this widespread shock confused me. Uh, my research in writing in American politics um, has taught me that violent white supremacy, state violence, and plunder of communities of color is the rule and not the exception in the United States. I don't think that there has ever been a time that we have lived without its effects. And if you believe that there has, then you are living in some wonderful world of privilege. I cannot point you to a time frame in American politics in which non-white peoples were not persecuted by, this, by the state government and or by the federal government. It simply does not exist. These are not new problems, to be very clear about where we are right now. Charlottesville did not arrive in our political universe with Trump. Writing about Charlottesville, the great poet Claudia Rankine, she's going to be here as part of the grad lectures in the spring, wrote about her confusion, and I'm going to quote her a little bit at length there because it has been really useful for me in this moment. She says, she's quoting here, I felt Charlottesville to be an everyday kind of condition, even as others described it as an unnameable terror. The KKK, white supremacists, and the alt-right were being referred to as if they beamed down, there we go, there, I told you I knew it would make sense, beamed down into our democracy. Renkin then goes to draw out how, in 2017, some groups are now considered the source of white supremacy rather than its amplification. And I want to say this again. In 2017, some groups, Trump, Milo, rural white voters, are considered the source of white supremacy and not its amplification. And this is an important distinction, I think. Where we are right now is not anything incredibly new. As I've just said, it's an amplification of what was. It's an amplification of our inability to appropriately come to grips with our political history, our long and continuing history of terrorism, in particular against black people in this country. But even if the events in Charlottesville are not entirely new, as I have alleged, Charlottesville is still a historic moment in modern American politics a moment that reveals something significant about the inescapability of our racial past. 
Charlottesville happens less than eight months after the first black president of the United States leaves office. So I want to try to think about Charlottesville today, but Charlottesville as a stand-in or a symbol of the larger, complicated, contemporary racial moment. I want to understand at some level why terrorism continues against people of color and especially against African Americans in this country. Um, at, at some level in this country, we've been able to stomach a kind of horrific racial violence in the name of, in the name of democracy and overlook its impact on African Americans. Um, and so I want to say a little bit about, I know that in the, my title, it's kind of from the Civil War until where we are right now. Um, but I want to think about what does it mean to think of racial violence in this country against black people as a constant and not as an aberration. Seemingly, some of the stories that we tell are, ah, slavery happened, and that was really bad, right? And then we lived out the better parts of our liberal tenets of our democracy. We moved past it, ah, then we hit, we hit Reconstruction. And then we hit this other period in terms of Jim Crow. And then again, we say that the civil rights movement and through mobilization that we moved past that. And then we got to, at some level, right, this first black president of this country. And then we have this moment now. And in so many of the ways that we tell oftentimes, we describe these stories, whether it's in news, TV, movies, and education, it's as, if, it's as if these moments of racial violence, these moments of state-sanctioned violence against black people in this country were just these, were just all of a sudden just happen, as if they are not a constant. In terms of part of, I, I, I say this sometimes, um, when I get these phone calls or these text messages um, that express shock and or disgust, after the killing of, of African Americans in this country, I'm always, like I said before, a bit confused by it, in part because there's just never been a time in which African Americans are actually free from racial violence. So my work, uh, my first book focuses on the NAACP's campaign against racial violence in the first quarter of the 20th century. And a lot of what I'm doing um, in my own personal work, in my own personal research, is to show the ways in which African Americans view their relationship with the state and view the possibility of reform through political and legal institutions. And so I tell this story that unfolds basically in the first quarter of the 20th century, um, and how you had some, some figures that we, that we know really well, such as um, W.B. Du Bois, and unfortunately some figures that we don't know as well, such as Ida B. Wells and the ways in which they organized around racial violence. And one of the things that I try to do for me um, as I was telling this story, especially in political, vi not political violence, in political science, <laughs> actually, <laughs> right. okay. Um, in political science um, was that people were like, oh, this happens and then we hit this much better period. And, and, and in part, what I'm trying to do is to think, if we privilege the voices of black political actors in the stories and the histories that we tell, might we get another story of how this country has actually developed and also the continuing structures that impede progress for different groups in our country, right? So one of the things that for me it's really important in the way in which I do political science is to at some level look at Take the words of somebody like Ida B. Wells, somebody like Walter White, not from Breaking Bad, right? Somebody like James Weldon Johnson, um, to take what they say and how they envision this country and how they see the possibilities of reform seriously. It also means that in terms of where I am right now and focusing on the Black Lives Matter movement, to think about very, very seriously how do these young, mostly young activists view their relationship with the state? How do, they feel, uh, how do they feel about the possibilities of reform? And how do they feel about structures, institutions, such as the criminal justice system, right? If you listen if you, and you hear this when they, when they, especially in terms of Black Lives Matter activists, when they give interviews right now, often the ways in which they are talking about their relationship with the state is that they view these different structures as violent structures, as constant, they feel that their bodies and their lives are constantly under assault. And for me, what's, what's, significant and, and what's significant about the contemporary Black Lives Matter movement here is that you, you have these similar calls for freedom, these, 
these similar accusations against the American state for allowing violence to happen against people of color. And these things, again, for me, at least in my research, have been a constant over time. I clearly have like five more slides. I also have two more minutes, so that's just not going to work. Um, but I will say, I mean, in terms of you guys got a, a quick snippet of another slide of mine. One of them focuses on the long period of lynching in this country um, to think about this is not something that it was just solely private individuals. Much of the lynching in this country happened with the complicit kind of wink and the nod of state governments as well as the federal government. And that has continued throughout the 20th century. Um, in terms of what is going on right now, there's ways that you can look at some of the operation of the criminal justice system. Um, and, and I think if you take a, a kind of, if you focus on it closely, it's hard not to see, or at least to think through the ways in which political institutions, um, in terms of their relationship, around, their relationship around violence, around black bodies and also communities of color. Um, and so for me, and this is, I will say this and, and, th and then I'll close, oftentimes I think when we think about terrorism, it's often something that happens away. It's not, we're not a part of that, we don't do that here. People commit terrorist acts in this country against us against our values. But I also want to think through the ways in which our values allow us to commit terrorism acts against people in this country who are citizens here. Thanks. OK, great. Um, Professor Goldberg. Chris, any extra seats at this point? Does anybody have any extra seats? There's one right there if somebody wants a seat. Okay, so I want to talk about reconstruction in the United States and Iraq. And the reason for doing this is that people who do Middle East studies always have this problem, which I think is the opposite um, of the problem uh, that we've heard about uh, earlier. Uh, and that is that it seems as if the Middle East is this strange kind of place, which is totally different from the United States. And it seems to me that if you look at reconstruction uh, through the eyes of recent events in the Middle East, uh, it looks awfully familiar, uh, which is surprising because it makes the Middle East look also awfully familiar. So when we think about reconstruction in Raqqa, uh, the usual questions that people ask indeed is what is terror, how do we define it, who are the terrorists, and can terror be excused? Uh, I want to ask a different question, which is when is terror a serious political threat rather than a criminal danger? Uh, for the most part, I think what we consider terrorism uh, to be a simply a criminal act rather than actually a political threat. But there are times when terror is a political threat. So the quick answer to when it is is that terror is a danger when it is deployed by the state. And I don't just mean violence by the state or coercion by the state. I mean the use of violence by the state against people who are not guilty of any crime or any other action <laughs> that is used to send a message to the population at large. That's a different definition of terror, uh, but it is also a fairly standard one. So terror is a danger when it is deployed by powerful social actors to recreate a state that has been shattered by external force. It's also a danger when it's simply deployed directly by the state. So the context here linking Reconstruction in the South and Raqqa is that military defeat shatters the state but leaves men and materiel available for conflict. The victor, the person who won the war, has real but very limited goals in the aftermath of war. The shattered state sets off conflicts over the nature of property relations and political institutions. Those have to be resolved if a new state is to be built. And terror is one aspect, but only one aspect, of the violence of conflict over the nature of state institutions. Uh, for people who are more esoterically involved in political theory, that's living in the world of Hobbes and Schmidt. As W.E.B. Du Bois put it in his book, Black Reconstruction, written in 1935, and it's important to recall that this is before uh, the Holocaust happened, uh, but while the Soviet uh, the Soviet Union was certainly in existence. He says, inevitably, when men have long been trained to violence and murder, the habit projects itself into civil life after peace. And there is crime and disorder and social upheaval, as we who live in the backwash of world war know too well. Du Bois was writing about the United States in the wake of World War I. And 
I think we also often make a mistake when we don't place Du Bois not only, we place him in the context of American history, but we sometimes forget to place him also in the other context that he belongs in of global and European political and social theory. He was, after all, the man who, the w, who um, Max Weber said was the most important social scientist uh, in the American South. So if we look at Reconstruction in the South, what we see is total defeat of the Confederate States, which was, after all, a state of the South in the war. The Emancipation Proclamation ended an economy built on slave labor. That is one particular political economy. The 13th Amendment to the Constitution precluded the possibility of return to slavery. In other words, that particular political economic order could not return if the United States was con to continue to exist. And the 14th and 15th Amendments, if enforced, gave African American former slaves political rights. Now, I'm going to put aside for the moment another very important question, which is the degree to which slavery itself relied on terror. Not simply coercion and violence, but also terror uh, in order to uh, survive. But the 14th and 15th Amendments certainly transformed the political situation in the American South, at least uh, in possibility. And that's the reason Du Bois wrote a Black Reconstruction. The first counterattack was not long in coming. The Ku Klux Klan was founded in 1866. In the words of the noted historian Eric Foner, a military force serving the interests of the Democratic Party, the planter class, and all those who desired restoration of white supremacy. It aimed to undermine the Reconstruction state. That is to say, it aimed to destroy the foundations of the new state in formation. In response, in 1870, a federal grand jury was impaneled and determined that the Klan was a terrorist organization. Their words, not mine. And hundreds of people were indicted, tried, and ultimately convicted and sentenced to jail terms. In 1871, President Ulysses Grant signed the 1870 Civil Rights Act in order to further respond to the violence of the Klan. And in fact, this was known colloquially as the Klan Act. And by 1872, the Klan but not white supremacy, was in fact broken. When the US government put its mind to it, it was possible to uproot and destroy terrorist organizations in the South. However, unfortunately, the US government lost interest. Non-Klan violence against the Republican Party, uh, and I know it's always strange when we realize that in the 1870s, the Republican Party were the heroes, <laughs> and the Democratic Party was the not so good guys, okay? But non-Klan violence uh, against the Republican Party and African Americans continued in the South. Armed confrontations in several states uh, broke out in 1873-75, and the political compromise of 1876 led to the withdrawal of federal troops and a willingness to allow white supremacy to regain dominance. After the end of Reconstruction, during the so-called redemption period, Southern elites employed legal and extra-legal methods, that is terror, not simply violence, but acts of terror to repress African-American and white Republican politics. And lynching as a public ritual, as well as an extra legal punishment emerged as one dominant practice and symbol of the new order. In other words, lynching was not simply an act, uh, it was an act of violence, but it was also a symbolic act designed to make it clear to the public at large who was in charge. Now, I'm gonna change focus. The Islamic State was founded in 1999 by a petty criminal and insurgent, Abu Mas'ab al-Zarqawi. Zarqawi was born actually in uh, Jordan, uh, but came to be a free roving uh, radical. He espoused Sunni supremacy in a country that is Iraq with an Arab Shi'i majority. He believed that the Shi'i were apostates and enemies and had to be wiped out along with their institutions as well as their communities, and he pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda. Uh, but he also lived, he had come to, to live in a state that itself was founded on terror, and that's the Iraqi state, the state of Saddam Hussein and the Ba'ath Party. We don't tend to think of the Ba'ath Party as a terrorist state, but it was. It was a violent state. It was a state that engaged in genocidal activity against many Iraqi citizens, but it was also a terror state. And here you see two Jewish uh, citizens of Iraq who were hung in a public square. Now, they weren't hung in a public square because there was no place to hang them in private. They were hung in a public square to send a message to everyone else about how the regime would deal with its enemies. And that, by almost any definition, is terror. Uh, 
except, I suppose, Jeff's friends who believe that states don't commit terror. <laughs> I use the word friends in an expansive sense. I know they're not, they're not necessarily his actual friends. Okay. In 2003, the U.S. invaded Iraq and shattered an already weakened uh, Ba'athi state. The U.S. famously dissolved the army, the Ba'ath Party, and other institutions of government, governance. So we're, look, we're looking at something that's quite a bit like uh, Reconstruction. The Shi'i had been repressed since the 1991 uprising uh, in the wake of the occupation of Kuwait, but it was clear that in a democracy, the Shi'i would be a majority. And the Kurdish Sunni community of the north also sought autonomy. It was in this situation in which the institutions of governance had been shattered and in which a new political and social compact had to be made that we see the emergence of terror as a real problem for Iraqis. Not, I would say, to be perfectly honest for Americans, but certainly for Iraqis. A problem for Americans insofar as we had created the situation in which terror could thrive but not a problem actually for Americans themselves. I don't expect Iraqi terrorists to be showing up in Brownsville any more than I expect Nicaraguan terrorists to be showing up in Brownsville, despite uh, the use of that as an excuse by different uh, governments. After Zakawi's death, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi became the leader of the uh, Islamic State, and the Islamic, the Islamic State in Iraq expanded but was initially repressed by an alliance between the U.S., the central governments, and Sunni tribes in western Iraq, the so-called Arab Awakening. Uh, in other words, when the state wants to, it can repress these kinds of challenges. Unfortunately, the Iraqi state and the U.S. government lost interest and decided there was no particular reason to integrate the, Sunni, uh, the Sunnis of Iraq into a process of governance. Meanwhile, in Syria, a mass and peaceful uprising had been transformed into a civil war. Mass demonstrations challenged the legitimacy and functioning of the Ba'athi regime, but outside aid provided arms which allowed the civil war to grow and develop. And the U.S., as we know, also uh, had no way of figuring out what to do. War allowed the Islamic State as an ally of the Nusra Front to gain a base in Syria, and in 2013, Baghdadi proclaimed the Islamic State as a state, the caliphate. If you have questions, we can talk about this, but uh, the caliphate stuff is just another way for gangsters uh, to talk about being able uh, to get as much, uh, to rip off as much loot from society as they wish to. Um, and we can also talk about so-called strict uh, adherence to Islamic law, uh, which evidently in the case of Iraq simply means uh, that women can be slaves, but men can't. If you want to reinstitute slavery in some sense of Islamic law, there's no particular reason that it should only encompass uh, women, uh, between the, especially between the ages of 6 uh, and 36. Um, I don't remember any particular Islamic law books making that point. The capital of the state was Raqqa, and it included major cities in the Sunni majority area, stretching as far as Mosul, uh, including Tel Afar and other places. And this regime also used terror. It used terror to extend its uh, territorial control, bombing public sites and monuments, including some very important Shi'i uh, monuments, and it also engaged in ritual public ex executions. That is to say, just like uh, the Klan and later other suprem white supremacist groups, the uh, Islamic State involved public executions, just as also the Ba'athi regime had done, in order to make it clear to the inhabitants of the state who was in charge. So when is terror a threat? When states use it. The Ba'athi states used it, Syria and Iraq. Uh, the Nazi, Nazi Germany used it. The Soviet Union used it. When elites use it to recapture power after war. And what are the effects? Increased conflict in communities, ethno-religious segregation, or ethnic cleansing, and state-enforced ethnic or religious supremacy. I want to make one last point just before I end about terror, because we tend to focus on terror as murder, uh, bombing, and the like. Uh, my first introduction to the terror by the Iraqi state uh, was about 40 years ago when I met an Iraqi communist who was living in the United States. Some of you may have heard this story, but I'm sure most of you haven't. Uh, he had a very interesting uh, face. One side of his face was like anyone else's face. It was mobile. The other side of his face, the skin simply hung from the face. It was like he was a cartoon character or a clown. And I later asked a friend, what was, wh why was this guy's face this way? And he said, it's very simple. When he was jailed as a communist by the Ba'athi government, 
He was beaten so severely on one side of his face that the nerve endings were pulped, and he can no longer control his face. And the reason they did that was that so every time that anyone saw him in public, they would understand what the regime had done, that it had done it on its own accord, that it had beaten him but had not made a mistake. In other words, that this was an act of terror and that everyone was to know by seeing him that he was a visible sign of the regime's power. Thank you.